formation. I want to be the Sakarian who are to be so bad. I want to be the Sakarian who are to be so bad. All right, this is this is a very important spot because every day from um, 2015 to 2016, I would park near the gift store, right over there. I would come down here. I would have a nine o'clock public relations meeting. I'd be walking here, and every day, uh, two uh, spiritual people by the name of Justin and Stacy would be sitting here on this very bench, hugging or doing uh, public displays of affection. And this would be the bench, and they did it literally uh, five days a week. Now, I was here, I think I had Thursdays off one semester, but I remember in around uh, 2015 and 2016, it would just be very frequent. And um, if you can think to yourself, just a, a kid in your trench coat, not like I have a Uzi gun or anything, who's walking and just staring them while they do this public display, Minding my own business, by the way, and then going in um, for my public relations class, I just open the door, and then we're just whatever it would be upstairs and whatnot. A lot of the classes would take place in this building, particularly electives and math classes. Uh, particularly my, um, a lot of my classes would take upstairs and elective. Um, Often, Stacy would come down the stairs a lot of the time, and I would see her. Was her um, name actually Stacy? Yeah, her name was actually. Oh, Stacey. okay. <laughs> um, and she was Chinese. Chinese, yeah. yeah. That building right there, the Joseph Ribbit Mansion. That's where you get the classes and you sign up, and you take whatever. But particularly, this good council hall in Lawrence is where you take all your classes, and that's basically the expensive dorm rooms. Um, you didn't live on campus there. I did not. I was a commuter. However. Um, weird Andrea Dorkin style date rapes appear over there. And I hear many bad things from that place. That's and the I, dorm? That's Is the dorm. That's the dorm over there and I feel very weird out by it. Okay, but here's the building. I don't know if this is open. This is Lawrence Hall. And a lot of my horrifying traumas come from this very hall I disliked. Uh, I was taking my last English electives. The only memorable thing I like from this hall is um, a class on communications and cultural anthropology, which was, I, again, was the only white kid. There was another girl, Stacy, I think, <laughs> and uh, a lot of blacks, but I'm not so sure if any of my writing is still up. Um, hello? Uh, well, I remember Molly being over here, and I think Molly was busy with something, and I would try to, and this was like when I was 22, I was really shy trying to talk to Molly, but I was just terrible. Like, if you think of like Rouge V game, where you're supposed to do a day game and bring up something, she would just be the only girl in here doing stuff. Now, accordingly, a PUA would be like, oh, just go up to her and talk to her, but then you, there's a foreign line of being creepy. But again, if you're like a kid that has like social trauma in a class of uh, other white girls that are picking on you because you want to bring up something political with the text because Terry Angleton said so, well, uh, what's, the, what's the chances of uh, trying to talk to a girl who's completely normative, artsy, whatever? But uh, again, that didn't go so good. Um, I believe there's a store called Maido, a Japanese store. I invited her one time thinking I was, she was a different uh, person named Francis, but it turns out it was the me Francis, and I was known for my uh, pranking, and she got mad at me and she left. That, that's another story, but uh, 
I just didn't like her because she would pop pills a lot of the times. And she was in a relationship where this black kid was approaching her, and I just feel like, ooh, what a stank, you know? But at the same time, I kind of had this crush on her, but it didn't work out. And even when my awkward social skills were playing, it didn't work out. But another particular thing, I was sitting here, and I was listening to the Petrus Ultra album on my uh, laptop. And I was making my senior project, not my senior project, my critical theory uh, uh, assignment on Derrida about the text. Right? And one of this um, uh, women came over, I forget her name. She liked, I suppose, Murakami, but tall, so my social justice class. And uh, she said, oh, I want you to meet up with you. You have a lot of good say. I think your senior project is going to be great. Now, again, my senior project is about the far right. And it's really weird because even talking about the far right is bad. But I think in particular she was also naive because I was in a fight with this Jewish kid. This supposedly gay Jewish kid with curly hair and glasses. And uh, one time I pranked the class and I didn't want to read the text. And I, I said the text was uh, Doge, D-O-G-E, Doge. And this kid, this Jewish kid was getting mad at me because he wasn't understanding my uh, theory that the text can be, and he was just getting upset and angry and yelling at me. And he just left the room stopping like a snob. And there was some tension between me and that Jewish kid because, again, he was one of the only males on campus along with me. And he just didn't like my guts, and he was a stupid part, even as a gay Jew, so I don't know. Um, but a lot of weird stuff was going on. Um, I think this was, and we're talking about the middle to end of 20, so this is early 2016. And I was becoming more of a beast, or more of a, uh, not like a, a Jack Donovan certain sense, but more of a, uh, a type of monster that was more depraved. I was, uh, I was, you know, I hope Trump comes in and defeats the liberals of Rosemont College. And I was, I was, I was at my limit with everything. And that's why that was some of my early writing. I was beginning to, my late writing of trip. That was beginning. To right all the nice dude. Almanize Babyface is younger, but a lot of the end of Almanize was written during that time, 2015 as well. I mean, it's a mix between what I wrote as a teenager and what I wrote uh, here. A lot of, I remember right exactly here, November of 2016, um, my uh, black professor, who was a woman, she was like a fan of Tom Sowell, and uh, it was election night of Donald Trump. She asked me, who are you voting for, by the way? And she knew exactly, she was interested in my far right project. And I said, well, I don't know, I hope things go well, but according to, you know, what everybody's upset, I have a feeling that the middle class is going to be voting Trump. We will know on that same election night, Donald Trump won. And I believe it was raining the next day. Yeah. Uh, a, a, a girl, a friend who was a girl of mine, who was like this fat black girl was crying. And uh, Miss Rucker was upset to hear the news that uh, Donald Trump won, right? I was kind of happy that day because it was a big fuck you to like everyone. When I went to my social justice class, um, I think her name was Catherine Baker. She said, oh, isn't it terrible? There still is Nazism, in uh, paraphrasing here, there's still Nazism in America. Well, Hillary won by popular vote, right? And she just didn't get it. And I think my, my senior project, which I presented a few months ago in April, was shining, was showing. And um, she basically, it was clear that there was a mirage going on, this professional liberal mirage. And everyone was crying and sad, but it made me feel like an adult where I felt like, Dear Jesus Christ, if you're reading Jack Derrida, Althusser, Lacan, and you think this alt-right troll is in positions of power, obviously I don't think these baby kids should be even be talking about this stuff because postmodern text is, you know, advocating this, like, far-right end, right? And it just shows you something very strange and hypocritical with everything. Um, but it just reminds me of, like, this was the last few weeks where I've had it and I was about to present my uh, Jack Derrida text thing and everyone got upset over it including Stacy, and um, uh, after that, I remember Timothy Jackson, Dr. Timothy Jackson asking me, 
Uh, this was the alt right. Uh, yeah, not not just far right. This was actually a side project when I had it with these the Jewish gay kid and this autistic kid who looks like Stark and Picard named Quentin. Yeah. And um, I, uh, I I made this project where I compared Atari Teenage Riot's 60 Second Wipeout album with Derrida's text. And you know, playing digital hardcore really loud, they didn't get it. And Jackson gave me a big fat F minus. He said I was point blank. I didn't understand deconstruction. And I said, well, no, I clearly stated that Derrida is starting a revolution. That Derrida wants, um, he's, he's questionable of all text and narrative. And he finds something sinister behind the text. And Atari Teenage Riot does the same thing. And if I present the class with examples like James Joyce writing a letter, dirty letters to his wife, that's not offensive at all. That's James Joyce um, talking behind the text who he really is as individuals. And same with Dorkin, where Dorkin wants to kill all the white men. So, if there's any other memories, there was this bitch, uh, this feminist bitch, I think, or this stupid white girl by the name of Emily. She spelled her name E-M-I-L-I. -I. And um, she walked, you know, down this thing. She thought she was this uh, feminist, really, but she was the most popular girl in school. She would constantly um, persuade or um, try to get her, you know, be pushy and Machiavellian so she could get an A-plus in all her class. And I do believe this year, when Rosemont had its graduation out over here, she was the guest speaker, or she was the cum de la, or whatever. Oh, yeah, the uh, cum de la. Whatever. Uh, what, what is it called? I, I can't... Not... Uh, and I just... I, I got the Rosemont magazine. I was looking at it. I'm like, it got me more trauma. Because I remember in a class I had with her and I said, why do you think everything's the patriarchy? That's like an anti-Semite saying everything is run by... You know, no, that's like a... You know, that's like saying everything's anti-Semitism or Jews saying anti-Semitism's there. And she got mad at me. And I tried to tell the entire class don't you understand there's been a soft cultural left takeover of all these textbooks? And if you really were intellectual, you wouldn't be uh, advocating for social justice. You would actually be critical of our liberal regime. And guess what? I get yelled at. And I think Emily was just typically the stupid thought, T-H-O-T, -T, that probably... Maybe the shrewd. I don't know if she had promiscuous sex, but definitely if you took like the irony bros from like the weekly sweat, they would definitely abuse and rape her like some Andrea Dorkin style date rape. And um, yes, I think Emily caused me the most trauma here because whenever I took a class with that fraud Jackson, um, I had to deal with her always speaking, always speaking, saying like, oh, Yates, he's a meanie, he's a fascist. I'm like, you don't get it. You just don't get it. And like, did was Jackson provoking violence or provoking like belittling me? And Jackson, I think he was just so stupid as like a bourgeois boomer from Amherst College coming here because his wife was here. And um, yeah, and him, her, and just seeing her as this like dainty little bitch, white girl coming over here thinking she's so cosmopolitan, whatever. I'm pretty sure she's gonna marry. She's gonna sleep with eight, 10 other guys and probably get married by the time she's 30. Maybe not, maybe she'll just be a spinster and um, get her a little uh, degree in education. Say she's saving the world. Here's the uh, uh, Gertrude Memorial Library. Here, I did a lot of my reading between um, end of 2014, all of 2015, and most of 2016 for like two years and a half. And uh, there was a lot of far right books in here. It's closed today, it's the Christmas week. But in this library, right next to the bathroom, you can come across uh, Francis Pacariaki's Imperium, uh, Michael Hart's A Hundred Great People, uh, Patrick Buchanan's The Death of the West, Revolut P. Oliver's The Yellow Peril, um, Lothard Stobbard's uh, The Rising Tide of Color, and there would be these old Wasp books about the far right. Did they have Spangler in there? <laughs> uh, yeah, they had... Not the, I think it was the death of the West. The it, of the West, yeah. I don't think it was, I think it was a variant of it. It oh, was like man. the hour of, I can't remember, but I looked at that and I put it down, I couldn't. But it's particularly, I remember just reading around this table over here, uh, Colin Wilson's The New Exist Existentialism, and just writing my notes. And as I was reflecting on my stupid modernist class, like I wanted to write about Heidegger, 
but my teacher says, oh, Heidegger's too hard, you should read Sartre. And right, if you look in Sartre and Camus, Colin Wilson is telling in his book, The New Existential, New Exist, New Existentialism, that, um, you know, there was this, there was that, that scene was too, um, got up into the whole cultural Marxism, or like left-wing culture, and Wilson said, the next scene should be criticizing these new boomers in power, or that it's not just about, you know, he's really saying this alt-right imagery of deconstructing those who deconstruct. Yeah. And I'm just reading this book, I'm like, everything my boomer professor, this bourgeois professor that is pretty much a dimwit, is telling me all this stuff like as a job and I was starting to doubt him as a person. I'm starting, I'm starting to think that, like this guy is like 65, 70 years old and he's he's trying to be this big brain nibba by trying to tell me like Sartre is still cool. Oh, he'll pull out his gun and say, um, you know, David Foster Wallace. Oh, you'll definitely like Wallace because he's new sincerity, right? He's like alt-right, but in the context of academia. But again, it, it, it's this, um, it doesn't work because I just feel like his music's so behind. He like Jimi Hendrix and Rush. Like, the professor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And He's it's still just, a boomer. There's some yeah, boomer yeah. And it's just yeah. this really subtle, like, it's like, are you liking this because it was cutting edge in the 60s and 70s? Yeah, I really don't know, but that's where I thought, like, stupid people can be in positions of power. And what makes him so stupid is that he allows, like, Emily and Quentin and the gay Jew kid to have a spot. And they're not that bright either. They're just parrots. They're just uh, copying off of everything. Yeah, it would be in here too. A lot of Yukio Mishima and Muakami and Oe. Is this the main library on campus? Yeah, yeah. And in this in this library, a lot of um, Japanese texts would be in there. I really gobbled up uh, Confessions of a Mask. Yeah, that's a great one. And um, Sun and Steel. And um, some... Uh, I forget that OA book where he's criticizing Mishima on his deathbed. Teach us how to outgrow ourselves, yeah. Hmm. Um, Norwegian Wood. Yeah. The Pornographers by Akio. I forget his name, but in particular, um, there is a copy of Hans Jürgen Sieverberg's uh, Parsifal and Hitler in there on VHS tape. And in the room, you could put in VHS tapes at free will and watch them. One time I was watching. Hans Jürgen Sieberberg's Parsifal, and Stacy came down and just looked at me what I was doing, right? And I was watching this like John Morgan Countercurrents approved like cryptic neo-Nazi Susan Sontag approved programming experimental avant-garde film. And she just looked at me and then she just left the room. Like something's go something's up with this kid if he's he's just watching things on VHS and old outdated art films, right? <laughs> um, Did you ever talk to Stacy? Once. Once once not not all she's kind of a figment of my uh, imagination but um, sometimes uh, maybe through encounters it, it's very strange to describe it um, I don't know um, mm -hmm. but I, I think that's that's interesting though the yeah. library right over here um, I think I think this is really depressing because Rosemont you know how cheap it is they're really just going to boost its price to a $44,000 school once they make these new buildings because what they're going to do is not that they're going to say they're an alternative to Villanova or Haverford. They're going to boost up their price because they're building these like new cafeterias or whatnot. Um, and I, I just have so much memories being in there where I was like the loser kid that didn't even like have a Raven dollar ticket to get in. Yeah. And all, like, the kids that were, like, not into this bullshit postmodern stuff would just be happy interracial couples in there. Mm -hmm. And I have no... They weren't English majors. I think they were STEM majors. And um, I just felt so isolated, right? Yeah. And now I see in two, three years the sidewalk is closed. And this building is now, again, existed almost a hundred years and now is dying after this decayed society where this was built as a women's college for the wealthy to do uh, elite in Pennsylvania to have their little girls go here and pamper them as princess princesses they opened it up in 2009 for guys I was one of them to join and then I guess they infiltrate their campus with Asians and other minorities to make it all multicultural whatnot but then you start to see what's really happening 
is that they're destroying these old traditions, their far-right library, and they're trying to bolster this image of the real conservatism is interracial couples of white male, Asian female, and to some degree there was also a ma Asian male, white female, uh, Eurasianism happening. Um, but I don't know if there's Eurasianism. It'll probably, that's my, that's my bet, is that out of this whole disgusting white postmodern bullshit of Emily trying to up everyone and this horrifying Sargon of Akkad autistic twin kid, I think Eurasianism will still exist here. And I think that is the only pure form away from this uh, kids, you know, falling into the rye, you know how I say, like catcher in the rye, like I would be the catcher in the rye and these kids are, you know, they're trying to fall for this, but I think Eurasianism is still pretty innocent. And there was this one kid here who I absolutely hated and he boils my blood. His name was Quinn, or Quinton. Uh, Quinton had Asperger's. Uh, he was in my math class and all my English classes. He was the so-called skeptic kid, meaning that he was cool because he liked to doubt liberalism. But he only doubted liberalism not in an Evolian way, but in a stupid Sargon of Akkad, centrist David Rubin, somewhat... This is pre-Jordan. Jordan B. Peterson wasn't popular yet, right? He was only being skeptical because he was role-playing as an intellect. Often he would walk down this... Uh, it was this fat kid with big cheeks and curly hair. And one time I had a um, Juanta, Junta Aizo t-shirt on. She, she, he's like, she, he, she's like a horror manga artist. I was still somewhat flamboyant in 2015. And um, he came to me and I had a mustache, right? I still do have a mustache, but this one was like a hipster mustache. And he asked me, oh, do you have a mustache like Frederick Nietzsche? And I was like, I don't know, I was kind of like socially awkward too, because I like to roleplay as an anime kid. And I I was I didn't know what to say. I guess that was him of initiating trying to be friends with me, but I kind of scoffed it off. I think it was over here he asked me the question. Over here. And um, I just ignored it. But a couple of times, he would get mad at me in class because when Jackson demanded me to speak in class about what I thought about say, Walter Benjamin, or um, Toni Morrison, I would say it's unfortunate because Toni Morrison is only liked for her skin color as a black woman, and a lot of her intellectualism, and then, you know, this brings up the shit-lib argument of egalitarianism and individualism, and literally, Quinn would autistically facepalm in class, I, I kid you not, facepalm, like the Jean-Luc Picard Star Trek meme where you're, you're facepalming. And um, <laughs> I, I thought it was uh, funny because um, you're, you're acting like a thing you watch on the computer, right? And he would yell at me constantly. And he would tell me, Harold Bloom once said that the text, yada yada, I'm like, I don't care about Harold Bloom, right? So treat everyone like an individual. And that is where I think is the problem with today's society and especially pseudo intellects with people who are socially retarded or introverted, they create their own class of, now they're the cool kid, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it was kind of a classical liberal almost, you would say? Yeah, I mean yeah. like the autistic people who follow Sargon of the Cod or like watch the, the, the distributist or some. Or now Jordan Peele. Yeah. Exactly. And so I remember as well, Quentin would be walking and some fat white girl would go and hug him. Right, right over here. And I would just be moody as well, you know, after seeing Justin and Stacy right there, walk my class was over at one, come down here. Oh look, Quinn's getting in a hug by some girl. You really think the girl fucking reads uh, Cormac McCarthy? Who's that guy who read uh, 35 to Yuma or that cowboy writer that's supposedly postmodern? Cormac, yeah. Cormac, yeah, he's obsessed with him. Yeah. Right? It's, so, it's so petty and um, he just hugs this girl all the time and like you think you're getting pussy because you're so smart and you're so intellectual and really this girl is just you know women are social constructs they think of you because you're the only guy that represents that and so like a monopoly you manifest something 
and I was turning and slowly manifesting as the normal white kid into this fringe, like, not only art hipster, but like this weird Elliot Roger, I'm gonna shoot up the school in my trench coat, like Ghost Man says. Um, but yeah, I wanted to be the weird, interest. it's not that I want to take the stage and tell everyone I'm this, I just wanted to be normal and just wanted to be, and I, I think I accomplished that, but the problem is, Everyone is so picky here at Redmond. It's like a small little cult. It's like a cult of just weird losers who can't make it in Villanova or Temple. So they come to Rosemont College to basically think that they're living their little narratives or lives, or they show their signs, right? But again, I started to realize that the only cool kids were Justin and Stacy or the interracial couples because they wouldn't they wouldn't want to be invested in this like bullshit of white people, Christian Lander stuff, white people like nonsense of, right? Why is, um, why is supposedly Quinn the cool kid? Yeah, because he reads Nietzsche, because he reads David Foster Wallace. Ooh, Zizek, right? When I say anything about like say Nishima or even Evola or Paglia or just weird out there uh, authors who are just like, like we're talking anything like Davila, the neo-reactionary South American, you know, wrote those axioms. I get stares, total stares right down. And you realize there's something wrong with this kid, you know? And so I felt that maybe I knew too much. Maybe I knew too much. And um, I started to think of myself as a queer and something was happening. That we're in this weird society now where kids are role-playing these desires. And the new loser is someone who knows too much, someone who is very artistic, and someone who is going against the liberal narrative. And when the gay Jew kid and Emily are all gears, police, to suppress the weird normal white kid, or even normal kid for that matter to be show his voice. They want to shoot them down. They are the college SJWs, but they say they're anti-SJW. And that's why I was so happy when Trump won, because it was a big fuck you to all of them. I'm pretty sure Quinn also voted for Trump out of this form of anti-liberalism, but at the same time, I bet he now bitches about Trump, just so he can get his little uh, friends or whatnot. So, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's very depressing. You have to live with this lark unit. It caused me a lot of trauma. And I still have revenge fantasies about these people, and I, I want to stab them in the back and create some new art. You're very, I'm not put it possibly too simplistic terms, you're very isolated in college, you don't really have any close friends, and were largely totally misunderstood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and all the people that were understood were LARPing as identities. And that got me interested in such people like René Girard, uh, Jean Boulogard with his whole science and language theory, Eric Erickson with psychosocial theory. I was prying this to psychologists. Now this was a time before Trump and Jordan D. Peterson, you gotta remember that. And um, this was the eye of the storm. This was definitely the eye of the storm. Like if you're a kid into KMFDM and Atari Teenage Riot, nobody knows what you're talking about. Nobody cares you go to punk rock concerts and things like that. And there's just blank, or you talk about art films, about, you know, Sheck, Stop Motion, Alice, I saw that the Brim, Brimmore. They don't care. The girls just want to be laid, get laid by men. And it sounds like a PUA thing or a master thing. The men are either trying to role play this image they saw on the TV about the college life. Really, it's just all mommy and daddy and nepticism creating that. Yeah, I just, I just think it's really unfortunate. And um, a lot of, I just wish, you know, maybe if I was 23, 24 again, and I was a little bit smarter, a little bit brighter, maybe I would be more unapologetic about what I've said. And I've learned a lot doing my own career as pill eater and what to say on the internet and how to, you know, because things are becoming more like you're joining a Discord server in a room with people and someone is literally controlling it as a language game. And there are so many people not going to college and giving up because of this threat. But as an intellectual, if you have the money and if you have the courage and if you have the loans, do it. Go to college and get your education. You know, it might not be this Disneyland vacation as Boulevard would say, that's it's turning into everything, but you have to fight for these things. And what we call the chads are those people who are like arrogantly normative and fighting. But at the same time, as a queer, 
I have hatred for Chads and Normies because they put down kids like me who want to have a space, a platform, and talk interesting things. But again, you are positioned as that kid, right? Just like how autistic uh, Quinn is like, oh, he's the Sargon of a COD kid. We know he's bullshit. We all have the internet memes to prove that he's a liar and that his theories are false. Whatever happened to the homo nationalist, the Asian Aryan, it's just the far out queer kid in the juju, right? It's like, it's all gone. And Rosemont College manifests this trauma that makes me do my art. And I, I, like a Wes Anderson film, it's not only just a revenge fantasy of wishing I was Justin, but maybe something that I can do better in the future. But yeah, this yeah. is, are you filming? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is where um, Justin Stacy uh, sit. And I had to deal with it every day. It's kind of ironic now that um, it's gone. That that relationship is gone, they're no longer. The, the reign of interracial couples between white male and Asian, Asian female is over at Rosemont. There's hardly any of an Asian community here. I remember coming from Temple University from Asian Studies and the first thing I wanted to do here was to be a part of the Asian club here. The irony is done by a bunch of white women, who, white girls I should say, who want to start the Multicultural and Diversity World Club. And my only other friends that understood of an Asian society or anime club was Asia. And so we tried to do something, but again, it was really hard. Same with the game club with Tyler, who had this kind of harsh autism to him. And that never really worked out either. either. And when I was kind of losing my faith in the whole, you know, people call it red pill or something. Um, it's weird because everything was starting to be conglomerated under Donald Trump's pressure. And we were starting to see this liberal takeover where it wasn't just the Asian pre-culture Asian club anymore, you saw the Black Power Club. And instead of the game club, it was like the gamer club. And Justin Stacy had kind of an identity. Yeah, well, it's identity kind of politics an over yeah. intellectualism started to come through and the, the most despicable people started running those clubs and I felt more of an outsider. And some of my friends were just either transferring out of Rosemont College to Drexel or Penn or Villanova, which I've actually thought about doing but I just didn't want to spend the money. And so rather like an angry, you know, act you LARPing as a middle class person, I just want to get it out, get my English degree and leave. And uh, it was really hard because they were really uh, testing me the last uh, few weeks on that. And uh, yeah, I, I, I feel that it's, uh, Rosemont College does cause me a lot of trauma. A lot of my later, uh, at least some of my early works I written was a teenager, I added on, especially Trip. Um, a lot of that was written in between the summer of 2016 and early 2017, um, and some moments in 2015 and 2014 as well. Kind of like an eclectic hodgepodge. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I always think some trauma at Rosemont actually obviously haunts me every day and has haunted me in 2017. I remember I was hanging out, we are talking about summer of 2017, literally six months after Rosemont, and I was thinking to myself, I was talking to my friend, my Jewish friend Phil, and we're at some alt-right guy's house, and we're having a sleepover, and I was I was crying, and I was telling him, I think of Stacy every day. That's it, Stacy. Yeah, yeah, and it became more symbolic of my own identity. I'm like, how come at the, just I just turned 25, and my life does not feel complete, but rather dependent on other people's souls. And I started, you know, do some soul searching myself. I realized, you know, J.D. Salinger was writing about this too, and the sandwich has no mayonnaise, and um, uh, the inverted forest, and things like that. And I've started to realize that the artist is, you know, suffering. And, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you're just gonna be like Elliot Rogers, you're gonna shoot up the school, right? Or Randy Stair from Pennsylvania, right? Obsessed with like Danny Phantom. And I'm like, no. It's more than that. I think everyone suffers through it. It's just that we have to be dishonest constantly in our life that things have not happened. Kind of like how a lot of Jewish people felt about during the Holocaust. You know, they didn't start bringing about the Holocaust until two few decades later. And then you heard all these Jewish traumas 
about what it was like to be in. You mean the intergenerational? Yeah, to, yeah, and so it's really suppression of thought. I mean, for people who, baby boomers who criticize their own 1950s white America, who probably had like crappy parents and things like that, and everything was too robotic. And that's why you see all this postmodern deconstruction art of trying to tear down things in a way. And why today, I believe, uh, queer culture under capitalism is is, is, is is like successful and whatnot. But um, yeah, I think it's really sad. It does bring me really sad at Rosemont because we see the building, they're tearing down that old cafe that's been almost there for 80, 90 years. And the last three, four years, I've witnessed happiness and bliss, right? In a away from identity politics, the far left cultural Marxism. And here they are and it's dying. Now they're tearing it down because of capitalism, because it was just a faded memory, right? I'm pretty sure today that everyone I knew is now a different person three, four years ago. It, it really wipes things off and it makes me sad like I'm still on this campus and I still feel I have a say but no one wants to hear me say anything and now I'm kind of flashing out on the world about that anger and sadness really.